Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being. We are in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 13 through 16. Uh, I'm going to read through this. We're finishing up talking about the elders and the deacons and moving into the reason that it's important and then going kind of into the middle of the letter. And we're going to have uh, some call it the Christ hymn. I, you know, I like to think of it as a creed. Uh, we're going to talk about the mystery of godliness, and he's going to make six points and it's going to kind of capture the, it's the high point of the book, and we'll get into it today a little bit. Uh, uh, it's, it's the mystery of godliness, so that's where we're heading for. So anyway, here we go. Uh, I'm going to just read chapter 3 in the NIV, and the new material will be uh, starting in, you know, say verse 13, as you see up here, uh, and then we'll read down through that Christ hymn to begin uh, to end chapter 3, begin chapter 4. So here we go. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, just in review. Uh, again, these are character traits that they need in their leadership. Uh, many of the leadership of the church of Ephesus are not following these guidelines. Uh, they've become corrupt, and these are, would be definitely improvements and reasons for disqualifying them from the position. Timothy is supposed to come in and make those changes. He's supposed to get rid of some of the leadership in the churches. And when we say churches, we're talking about house churches. There's people that are probably going around from house to house misleading people. It would appear that the ladies uh, that are, are being misled and are following after them, and that they've gone after the false teachers. There's always this combination. If you look through church history, it's a combination of false teachers men teaching false things, drawing a crowd after themselves, uh, and a lot of times it's the ladies, it's the women, and they start supporting it, and they end up causing confusion, and they're supposed to, the, the, supposed to stop, shut up, it says the same thing in Titus, stop the false teachers, and ladies go back to following the obedience of the faith that is, is established. So here we go. These are the qualifications of the overseer and the deacon and leading into the next part of the chapter. Here's a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach, a husband of but one wife, which again indicates that maybe some of these guys weren't doing this, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well uh, and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? Now, this kind of brings up the idea of the household, which is going to come up in these verses today. Household, especially as we go through the next chapters, the concept of household, it, it involves the church is a household of God. But then the families each have their own households. And so the, the representation of what God is doing in the church is seen in the individual households. That's kind of an interesting connection that is being made here. Uh, he must not be a recent convert. I mean, that's a, that's a red flag. Or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. And as we get into these verses today, we're going to see two important things that the whole movement of Christ or the Christ hymn, the Christ creed, it's about outreach, taking the message to the world. We call it evangelism, mission work. And then once you're converted is godliness, becoming like God. Not that you're going to become God, but you're going to have this, you're going to start transforming into the image of God. We call it the fruit of the spirit. And so right here, the, it, the important thing here is they must have a good reputation with outsiders because the mission of the church is to take the message, the truth, the gospel, to the world. Well, if the world's already rejected you because of some weird cultish behavior that doesn't make sense to them, again, we're not talking about they're living in sin and you're living in righteousness. We're talking about, well, this whole idea, uh, they must be above reproach. That, that is with all people. You must be in line with your society, with your community. Again, we're not condoning sin. If, the, if, the, if, the, if your culture is like embracing transgenderism, it's like, well, we want to stay in step with the culture. We also, it's like we're not talking about, we're talking about, like we said like last week or a couple of weeks, the foundations, you know, individual responsibility, marriage, family, 
a, a healthy culture will always want individual responsibility. You are responsible for yourself. You're responsible for providing for yourself. And if you've got a wife, you're faithful to your wife. If you've got a family, you're responsible to take care of your family. It's like that's not like a, a new Western American concept. That would, that's you know, that's Babylonian, that's Chaldean, that's from the Garden of Eden the way it is. So that's what we're talking about when we say above reproach and having a good reputation with those outside. Now when those outside go off like Sodom and Gomorrah into sin, it's like, no, we're, we're not going there. And that's where we're going to get into this. The church is the pillar and foundation of the truth so that you're coming out with a message of, of hope for the world. Next, verse 8, deacons likewise are to be men worthy of respect sincere not indulging in much wine and again notice those both come up so it would appear that the the elders the deacons that timothy's coming in to make corrections on have a problem with wine i mean because it doesn't say don't drink wine it's like okay you guys are drinking too much wine and then you're becoming violent and now you're becoming quarrelsome i mean these are not like great christian traits you know when you become a christian it's like these are common sense i mean what culture wants drunken leadership that are violent and quarrelsome and can't manage their own ho households it's like well even the pagans don't want that so these are not like a great list of christian virtues like say you know the fruit of the spirit these are standard leadership qualifications we've said that before uh and not indulging in much wine and not pursuing dishonest gain which is probably going on they must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience, they must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, their wives, or women, are to be women worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. So when it says uh, also their wives, that can be talking about behind the scene, behind the, the, uh, the deacon, or we could actually be talking about deacons as men, or if you are the woman and you're in a deacon position, and we have that, we have the deaconesses that are mentioned in Scripture. There are women that are leaders within the church, some kind of leadership that they're responsible for. They the same way, but again, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. Now, verse 12. A deacon must be the husband of but one wife and must manage his children and his household well. Though, now, here's our new verse that we're going to start with today. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. So those that are doing these things, you're going to have a benefit. There's something that's going to empower you. And we'll talk about that. Although, I hope to, now, this, now we switch. Paul now goes into second person plural, talking to just Timothy. And again, he's writing the whole book to Timothy. But that was instructions for the church. Now, he gives him a personal message. Although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household. So in other words, so far the whole book has been for this, so that until I come, people will know what kind of behavior, we'll talk about that word behavior, what, con what conduct, what it's supposed to look like, so you can have a guideline. And then when I come, I'll, I'll check up on it. Uh, themselves in the in God's household see now we talk about the elders or the deacons the overseers household now we've got God's household God you are now in God's household as a believer and they can, that can be the local and again as we talk about church or God's household it's going to have the local appeal but it's also going to have that universal it's it, it's which way are you talking about and, and both would be applicable uh all to uh if I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, now it describes it, which is the church, the ecclesia, well, we'll talk about that, the called out ones, of the living God. And it, it's, don't think Paul's just trying to write words like he's writing a report for school. He's got to be like, you know, 5,000 word reports or just throwing in words. When he says the church of the living God, that, that, that must mean something. Now, we're not exactly sure what Paul's thoughts were, but he doesn't just say the, the, the church of God. He says the church of the living God. Now, why is that word important? I think we've got a few things we can see. And then describes the pillar and foundation of the truth. Uh, and again, truth is that universal truth. And I like to have always thought of that as universal truth. But as I've studied this, that may be talking about the church's specific message. 
especially when it identifies here, uh, universal truth is available to all people. Philosophers can find universal truth. Uh, Romans talks about that. All men know certain things. But the church has to support that. That's what the requalification of the elders and deacons were. But now it says uh, the, the uh, foundation of the truth this is probably, well, the mystery, the, the revelation. And it, it goes right into that right here. And this is a great line right here. Uh, beyond all question, beyond all doubt, the mystery of godliness is great. And we'll, we'll spend some time looking at that. The mystery of godliness is great. And there's no, that word means, you know, there, there's no question. There's no contending this. There's no contending this. And when I say the mystery of godliness is great, there's really no discussion after that point. It's like, it's like this is beyond philosophers. This is beyond, and I'll mention it again probably, but that word great, it's interesting. This is great, and this is being written to Ephesus. Now, do you remember, have you ever heard the word great used in the setting of Ephesus before? And you have, if you go back to Acts, the reason Paul's dropping Timothy off and he's not going into Ephesus himself may be because of that riot in Ephesus where everybody started shouting because their, their economy had started turning away from uh, the temple of Artemis and had gone a different direction. And the workers that were pr gaining because of the temple of Artemis and Artemis worship, which was worldwide or at least in the Mediterranean world, uh, they started a riot, went to the theater, and they spent the whole afternoon shouting, Great is Artemis of the Athenia, Athenians. Uh, uh, great as Artemis, sorry, great as Artemis of the Ephesians. I was going to try, try and say Athena or something. Um, and now, if it's, in, if it's, we don't know for sure, but that's, that's the last time Paul was there is he left with the riot. Great is Artemis. He now comes back and says, great is the mystery of godliness. In other words, that's their religion. Now great is this. And so it's almost like a contrast potentially. Again, we don't know that for sure, but it's a sure fun play to say that's what they were saying. He's telling them now, you used to hear this shouted in the theater. This is what is great. The great is the mystery of godliness. And here are six points, and we'll spend some time looking at these. And, and I remember reading this as a kid. You read this, and it's just like it, it, it kind of makes sense. It sounds Christianese, but it, it, it's... It's like the pinnacle of the book. It's right in the middle. And it's the, the deepest, richest part of theology in this book. And yet it's, in a, in, it's like a poem. It, it's like a hymn. Did they sing this in the early church? Uh, nonetheless, Paul uses this. Did Paul write it? Did pa Paul pen it himself? We don't know these things. But he does put it in the center of the book, and everything's hinged on this. And I think it means everything to us. Uh, the mystery of godliness is great. And here it is. He appeared in a body was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, and then again, right there, yeah, that's one thing, but then look at this one, was believed on in the world. See, there's power right there. He was preached in the nations, and what happened? They believed and was taken up to glory. Now, again, there's a little bit of a, what we would say, a chronological breakdown, because I would say, you know, he appeared in the body, was vindicated by the Spirit, seen by demons, was taken up to glory, and then was preached to the nations, and then was believed on in the world. Well, Paul puts all those there, and then some, there's a reason for that being at the end. I mean, he knows the chronological order. But that right there, that, encaps, that, that captures the, the mystery of godliness. So those are our verses uh, today uh, that we're building on. And so in your notes, looking in chapter 3, verse 13, uh, the first thing that it says after going through all those uh, requirements of the leaders, he sums it up in chapter 3, verse 13 to end that discussion uh, in the English Standard Version now on these notes. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. You've got your Greek right there, so you can see it says, those for well having served. So you don't see the word served well as deacons in the Greek, it just says those who well have served. And that, that is the word where we get the word de deacon from, and that is serve. Uh, they, they have served. It, it refers to, like we talked about, you know, waiting on tables, uh, of being in a, a ministry. Uh, and when we say ministry, we think of, you know, you, you, you go to university, you go to seminary, you get into a ministry, uh, and then you're the leader because you're the minister. You maybe are the head minister. Uh, this is no, this ministry 
is is service. Uh, it, it, it's what a waiter does at a table. And in the Christian ministry, everyone's got to, as we've talked before, everyone in the church, everyone a, a believer in Christ has a place of service. Now, again, it comes in different ranks, different places. Um, but this is talking about those who serve well. And it's talking about, it, because the word serve is the, from diakonos, it talks about deacons. Uh, in the English translation, so it's talking about that list that we've just talked about, the overseers and deacons. If they've done, if they've done well, if they have done these things, if they're serving with the right intention, they're not in for for profit, uh, they're not misusing the people, they they're having discussions and they're not quarreling. Because and you've got to provide leadership. Meaning, when someone starts to go off track, we can see this here in Timothy, but definitely in Titus. You're going to have to confront. It doesn't mean they're, they're nice. My gosh, that, that's becoming one of my, the words I hate, you know, nice. The last thing I want anyone to say, if anyone ever goes out and says, well, what's Galen's ministry? What's Galen like? Well, he's nice. It's like, what? Where have I failed? The last thing I want you to say, well, he's nice. It's like, oh, it's like, what kind of judgment am I facing in eternity? We've heard that you're nice. You've been nice in your ministry. It's like nice is not the qualification of ministry. It, it, it's, it would be patience. It would be not quarrelsome. But you are going to confront, and someone has to walk away saying, well, that wasn't very nice. I mean, you understand, I, I'm not trying to justify problems. But if, if you can go through your whole life, if you can go through your ministry, if you can stand in front of people your whole life and, and teach, and everyone walks away going, well, that was nice. It's like, well, someone has to get a fan. I want, you know, I want to be able to preach to the nations and the world believes, but there's going to have to be someone that slams the door and walks out because they're mad because you weren't very nice. Uh, yeah, okay, I could spend all time justifying my corrupt behavior. <laughs> But notice right here, uh, serve well. This is talking about those qualifications. And again, not quarrelsome. They're not violent. They're not going around looking for problems. They're solving problems. But there is going to come a time where you're going to have to have someone. Well, Timothy, he's not coming in and correcting the deacons. Okay, now some of you guys are drunkards. Some of you guys have gathered a bunch of women together, have your own little harem. Uh, I, okay, now a lot of these things we're going to have to make some correction, but I don't want anyone to get upset. We can, we can work with everyone. No, these guys are gone. These guys are gone. You're disqualified. He's cleaning house. So this guy's mad. This guy thinks, Timothy, you're not very nice. Paul's not a very nice guy. And it's like, well, yeah, because they're doing their job well. They're not quarrelsome. They're not divisive, but they are doing the work. So now what it says here, those who serve well as deacons, it says gain a good standing. Here, I'll just write the word here. We'll look at the Greek here. Good standing. And it says for themselves. And also great confidence, and these are two things, two different things, confidence in their faith in Christ Jesus. So good standing, if, if a deacon, and again, this can refer to the, and it is in reference, in context, referring to the overseers and deacons that were just described, but this would go for anyone who is serving as a Christian, which would be everybody is serving somewhere. If you can do that, in a in a way that is beyond reproach that is in line with the th qualifications uh paul is setting down with timothy you gain a good standing now the word what, what's good standing mean again it doesn't give you a whole list of description but you'll gain a good standing for themselves and uh point three uh is it the word they're acquired it means to preserve or get possession of meaning you're going to get possession of this uh, the word uh, good is, I think, kelos in there somewhere. Uh, but the word standing is bathmon. You can see it there in, in the notes. It means, just the word bathmon means a step or a degree. It refers to a step in a stairway. So you're going, you, it's a step in a stairway. That's, that's what it would refer to, a, a step, uh, or it, it, the actual meaning. It refers to a stage in a career. It can refer to a career, uh, a level of your career. You're started here. You're moving here. You're moving here. You're moving up in your career. It, it's a physical step. It's a position in your career. Uh, it, it refers to a position. It is also says it's an excellent standing or high, highly esteemed or held in high regard in the church. This can also be just, uh, we'll just, I don't know, the word view 
uh, or the esteem, the value, the, what you uh, uh, are recognized by other people. So a per, uh, an elder, this is saying something about an elder or an overseer or a deacon who's serving and done a good job uh, leading the people the way Paul is intending. Uh, they gain a good standing. They, they gain a step. Like they're, they're going up. Uh, they've moved up in their career. Now this is hard to think that Paul is talking about you know, moving up. You're going to come in as an, an, a, a, an associate pastor, maybe a youth director, and then eventually you're going to be able to conquer and have your own mega church. And you can move your career up. And then right here, now you're driving the nice cars, and uh, you know, your wife's got good-looking hair because they got all this money to spend on her hair. And it's like, this is what we're, if you do a good job, you can, it's like, I don't know we're talking about career here. But you could, like you can see, People in the church coming in as, even in the book of Acts, they came in as table waiters. And as they moved up, they pretty soon they were in charge of the doctrine. They were in charge of teaching. They were sent out to follow up with Paul in his ministry or the apostles. So again, that's not a money maker, but you get more responsibility. The main thing probably would be here is your view or the opinion. And it would be yourself and those in the church. You gain a good standing in the view of the people in the church, they've, le- they've learned to trust you. you. You have something. When you step in, they're, 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 they're counting on you. And you, can, you all have experienced this. Uh, you have a, a good standing, a, a good view of yourself. It's like, well, can I do that? It's like, well, I've done this, and I did this well. I, I think I can, God has asked me to do this. And you see God using people. Talk about David. David protecting the sheep. David fighting Goliath. David leading the kingdom. David being the son of of the messiah i mean you can see david has gained these things so this is what it means you gain a good standing uh something about moving up moving up a step or in the view of yourself of people it can even be in the view of god you gain a good standing god's view of you is he can trust you it doesn't say specifically it can be self it can be god's view it could be the church's view and uh it may be all of those together, unless you gain a, a good standing, because you've proved yourself faithful in those qualifications. That's the first thing. And then it says, number five, uh, great confidence. The word confidence comes from, you can see the word right there, parousia, which means basically freedom of speech uh, and confidence, and it usually means boldness. So you, gra- you gain great boldness, great confidence, and that, first of all, speaks of speech is you, you, you're confident to say what needs to be said. Uh, and then that's in reference, and again, the word great pollen is used there. Uh, it's used in, in faith, great in your boldness, in faith, in Christ Jesus. So this, this one right here is on what your, your faith is, your confidence in speaking, leading, your, about your own faith that is in Christ Jesus. This refers to your, your position in Christ. If you can do, Paul's saying to Timothy, if, if an elder or deacon can follow these and, and the, the requirements and a good repro- approach, they're going to gain a, a, a good standing in, in their own view, in God's eyes, in the eyes of the church, but also they're going to have great confidence and boldness when it comes time to make a statement, to make a stand to live their christian life they they know it works and again you can see someone and you can experience it we've all failed or sinned or done something wrong where all of a sudden you you know you can see this you're 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 not you don't have good standing you're kind of you're not real sure of yourself you know you can know that i should have done that different and now it comes time to well what do you think well i'm not sure if i'm really the best one to speak on that because and you don't have the boldness and so the church is needing people that can follow these things, the, the church of Ephesus, that can follow those requirements. And when it comes time for leadership, when it comes time for performance, when it comes time for them individually to represent Christ in their speech and their lifestyle, they're bold and they've got a good standing. People are going to follow, which means it's just going to keep expanding. The church is just going to keep expanding because, again, of the witness. So that's, that's what that is saying, uh, concluding that. Now, chapter 3, verse 14, bottom of page 1. I hope to come to you soon. Now, I'm not sure if that means, you know, I've said that Paul dropped Timothy off because he knows he's in trouble legally in Ephesus, and that's probably going to lead to his final case when he's in Rome and, and has gone on. It may be that he just, he's going somewhere else. Titus has got Crete, Timothy's got Ephesus, and he's going up into Macedonia to the Philippine church or something. 
uh, this gives the impression he's going to come to him soon. Is he going to come just visit Timothy, or is he going to come visit the church? Uh, he leaves that open. But I am writing these things to you so uh, these things to you so that, um, and that's uh, the next box right there. Uh, Paul sums up what he said. Let me say so that, yeah. The things he's saying, I'm writing, stay with me here. He's writing these things. That's what has already been done, the things that are already written. But he's also going to be adding some more to it. There's still three chapters coming that is going to be added to this. These things are, have been written, and he's going to follow up on it, continue. He's reminding Timothy so that people, the reason for that is, uh, and that goes into chapter uh, 3, verse 15, the next verse, so that if I am delayed, or if delayed, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and buttress of the truth. Meaning this, this can't wait. I, I've written these things to you. You need to fix those elders. I'm going to give you some more instruction. And this is now the church. The church, the, the, the household of God. And in here is going to be conduct. People are going to be behaving in here. Right now, the church of Ephesus is not behaving as they should, and it's going to start to collapse. It's going to start to fail. This church right here, and you can see it in this, has got two missions. Is going to be outreach, we'd say growth. Uh, and again, be careful with growth because if you market anything well, it can grow. You can even market a COVID vaccine. Um, but, I mean, it's like it, it growth, it's healthy growth, not just marketing. But also, right here, inside, is going to be godliness, meaning expansion and then purification on the inside. That's what he's looking for. And for that to take place, he's writing these instructions so that the church of God will know how to behave. And that's what this is saying right here. Uh, if delayed, you may know how one ought to behave. If you go down here, I've got some things in the Greek box there in the middle of page 2 under 315. I've got the word hina, H-I-N-A, circled. That is the purpose clause. If, however, I should delay so that. The reason I'm writing this letter, the reason 1 Timothy is being written is this. So that. This is the whole purpose. So that. You may know how it behooves one in the household of God to conduct oneself. Now, this right here, this conduct oneself, it's not as simple, this conduct is not as simple as uh, a list of rules. Uh, it's, it's not, you know, obey. It's not just these, this religious system. This is conduct. This word, uh, it can mean, well, let's look at it. It can mean, I'm looking down at point three. Ought to behave is anastrepho. It means to overturn or turn back. It's used here of more than just behavior, of obedience to rules. It means the appropriate lifestyle. So let's say that. Uh, a conduct's a nice word. Uh, lifestyle is a nice phrase. Uh, it's, your, it's more than just behavior. Because if you, if you join a group, let's say again, Think of a religious organization. Think of a, you know, you've got the 10 rules, you know, the 15 points. This is what we wear. This is what we eat. This is what we don't eat. This is more about the life. This is about how wh this growth that's taking place. There, there's some freedom within this because you're going to have different people, different gifts, uh, different financial settings, different skills, and so and they're in different cultures. So you can't just railroad and force everybody into this one mold. But within here, in this growing body of believers, there is a conduct, there is a lifestyle, and this letter is to communicate, how to, what does that look like? Um, here, I've got the verse written down here, uh, bottom, bottom page 2.3c. 1 Peter 1.17 uses the same word. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile. So your time of exile in that concept is you're living your life in this world away from the kingdom of God. Now, God is going to judge. God is going to judge 
your deeds. What you do is going to be judged by God. This will be judged. Now, with that in mind, whatever you do, consider your conduct, your lifestyle in your age of exile. Because this, is good. this will produce deeds. I guess what I'm trying to say is if you just say, give me a list of the deeds I'm supposed to do. Well, you're supposed to give money to the poor. You're supposed to pray. You're supposed to be nice. You're supposed to, okay, well, what was your basis of your conduct? Now, again, this would be where you get like a hypocrite. You're, you're doing these things, but you really aren't the genuine. What Paul, and he's heading for this. We're heading there. The mystery of godliness is great. Is right here. We're coming into you, and we're bringing into you life. The life of God. It's coming through. It's all about. It's not about me teaching. It's not about, in a sense, you know, being religious. It's not about what's right and what's wrong, although that's the bad way of going kind to of cut that out of the tape. Uh, it's about Jesus Christ. God became flesh, and you now have access to this life. And with that life, you're going to become godly. You're going to begin to have produce the fruit of the Spirit. The things that offend God are going to start to offend you. you know, and you've, we've all done it. Things that, that you used to do uh, that didn't bother you. Now as you mature, it's like, wait, that's not right. That's not right. Or some of the religious bondage you were under when you were younger. As you get older, it's like, well, that's not the point. You know, it's like you, you start to find this life becomes your relationship and it's the conduct this is how we live this is what is being produced in me and you become godly and if you and this is one of the short circuits of a, a very tight like a religious organization or a very broad social you know operation like in a church is you have this target over here what's acceptable where this is this is okay or this is what we do it's like okay well just come in here and act this way this is dead. This is power. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. You can't always see who is godly and who is a form of godliness, but has no power. I mean, you can't, you can't, you don't know. I mean, in a period of time, it may become evident, but you can't tell. They're, these people are, are going to the same churches. These people are in the same fellowships. These people are both wearing the same cross necklaces. This person doesn't know god they're just following rules they haven't been changed they haven't been conformed and they're they're working on their own power they're going to collapse you can't maintain that act this right here the mystery of godliness is great and it comes back to jesus you don't need a sermon on how to be good you need a sermon about jesus you you don't need to be introduced to a new set of rules we've got a new set of rules that are going to transform your life that that's over in this category this is we know a person who is god himself who came in the flesh and he joined with us you now can join with him and become godly well what do we do okay now in this in this household of believers there is a certain conduct you see, that's what Paul's referring to Timothy. He doesn't say, Timothy, until I come, here's a list of ten rules I need you guys to start following. Stop eating this, start doing this, and, and do these rules. It's like he, because that would, that would confuse people, because that's what religion's like. He's trying to get people to focus on this flow of Jesus is your life and becoming godly. So let's look at this verse 15 again. If I delay, you may know how, to, how one ought to behave, and that's the word conduct, or the lifestyle, in the household of God. Like I have a household, the elders and deacons in Ephesus, they had a household, but now God has a household. This is his way, his house. Now you've got rules for your household, but it's not so much rules I mean, I don't know how your households were. We had more, I guess, here, again, I'm using myself as an example because I'm the only household I've got. Uh, and I just got Tony in my household now, uh, which is another whole, ca another whole fun, adventurous life that we've got. We don't have, like, little kids following us around everywhere. Um, we do have them calling all the time, though, um, <laughs> for good, you know, to show us what their kids are doing, so, which is fun, too. So keep calling kids. Um, but, you know, we had certain rules, but it was more about... An attitude. Imagine, imagine, again, I think, 
if all I had was rules, that would crush the kids, the, my, my son. It would be like, well, it's like, why? Well, that's the rule. Well, it doesn't make any sense in this situation. Well, that's what Dad says. You, you, it was like you had a guideline. You had a style of living. Uh, let's say we, were, we would be, you know, respectful. Uh, and you didn't talk back to Mom. I mean, it's like, well, Mom's wrong. Well, that's not the point. The point is you don't talk back. It, the, we're not talking about these. We're talking about this conduct of mom is talking, you listen. And, you know, and I'm not saying Tony was wrong. I'm just saying you, if you have just these rules, uh, it becomes kind of dead and stagnant. You're going to have to have some flexibility and, and move through the situation. And same thing here. Uh, it, it, they're looking for God. Okay, I, I, I wandered off there. If I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God and his attitude, which is now the church... And again, be careful right here. And that some translations have been gone out of their way to make sure they translate household of God instead of house of God. Because if you translate that house of God, what pops into your mind? The church on the corner, the building on the corner, the house of God. Oh, the house of worship, the house of God. No, we're talking about the, the people, not the building. And the same thing now, household of God, which is the church. And now church, ah, the church. No, no, be careful. Church is the word ecclesia which you you know and in in paul's world ecclesia as you know was the called out ones and it wasn't a christian term it wasn't a jewish religious term it was a a greek roman word in their cu culture when they would have a a selection of people coming from the community that would be called out to meet to represent the community for some purpose it'd be like the the city council the called out ones it would be like the the school board the, the called out ones would be called together for a meeting these are god's called out ones he's having a meeting and the, you're not just the called out ones you're also those of his household you are his family and he's called you for an assembly now again this called out doesn't mean you've been called to church at at, at 10 30 on sunday mornings uh, for a 45 minute service every week we're called out to go to church now you're called out of this society you're leaving again we talked before was it monday night monday night talking about dual citizenship in Colossae. you're in the in Colossae in christ and again just point that out i don't want to be repetitive but Colossians, Timothy comes, or Paul makes it very clear that talking to the people of Colossae, you are those saints who are in Colossae in Christ. Well, you can't be both. No, you are in both. You are in this world. You're in this city. You're in this government, but you're also in Christ. Now, everyone in West Des Moines is in West Des Moines. You're part of the city of West Des Moines. So, and so are we, or if you're from Urbandale or wherever you're from. Uh, but there are some that have been called out and are also in Christ. So now I'm no longer in West Des Moines. I'm no longer a citizen. Well, no, in Christianity, in the Bible, we have dual citizenship. We are members of this society, but we're also members of Christ or members of the church. And you have to be above reproach in this age, in this world, in this citizenship, but also above reproach in God's kingdom. And so when we're talking here, you've got the household of God, which is the church of the living God, Ecclesia. Think the called out ones. These are people that have been called out of Ephesus. They've been called to God. Uh, and they, here it is, the ideal of the, the called out ones, the called out of God. Again, called out is Ecclesia. That would be the church of God, you see, you see what I'm saying when I say Church of God, right away it's like boom. Just you, for my mind, I just go into a. So what church do you go to? Okay, we all have churches. We have a, just like they had local houses they would meet in. We have local churches we meet in. This is all of those who are going to the local houses in Ephesus, or all of you that are going to the local churches, the called out ones of God. But he adds this word. And I said it already of the living god and that adds something to it for some reason and i think i've got that written down on page yeah top of page three see we're moving through the notes stay strong of the living god and why i mean 
Paul doesn't put a footnote and say, I added living because of this reason. Uh, maybe he's just, you know, being creative, adding those words. But we are the called out ones, the church, the ecclesia of God. But this is not just God. He's described as the living God, which could be in contrast with the dead idols. You've got all, on all these people, uh, now we don't come from a society that we came out of idol worship, but all these people in Ephesus probably had dabbled in or had been fully involved with Artemis worship in their life. They just grew up. It's kind of like, you know, have you ever celebrated Christmas or the 4th of July or Thanksgiving? Well, yeah, I've, I've gone to a 4th of July parade. Okay, well, you're familiar with it. Not that those are wrong, but they, Artemis was like Christmas, Thanksgiving, a 4th of July parade. Everyone did it, but they were dead idols. Uh, we don't have idols in that sense of, of religious idols. I could replace this possibly with, I would say, philosophy or modern academics. You know, when you get into Big Bang evolution, material, the naturalist, where they have, we don't have idols, but we've got philosophies that are dead, and that you, you hold to. This, this, is, this is the living God. This is not that. That could be what he's referring to. The other two that we've got here, the living God who is alive and present with his called out ones, the reality of God with his people. So we can just say, and this is, again, this is absolutely true, uh, that God, Jesus ascended into heaven, but he sent his spirit. And that's not like, when he sends his spirit, this gets into the Trinity. When he sends his spirit, that's not like, well, I'm going to go away, so I'm going to send my cousin, and my cousin will kind of oversee that, you know, like Paul left Timothy, and Timothy, is Timothy Paul? No, Timothy is Paul's representative. It's, be careful right there uh, with the whole, the Holy Spirit is not, in a sense, God's representative because the Holy Spirit is God. I mean, so it's like, well, so the Holy Spirit's kind of representing Jesus until Jesus comes back. Kind of, but that's really not solid theology because the three are one, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is leaving and he sends his Holy Spirit. So, well, where's God? Well, Jesus is God. God is the Holy Spirit. So when we ha if you just want to simply say Holy Spirit, uh, that is the spirit of the living God is in the presence of the called out ones They've been born again and his presence is there So this is the living God who is dwelling whenever the household meets together or wherever they go as the called out ones Not just when they're in meeting uh, The living God is is there you don't have a spirit of Artemis You may have a demonic spirit, but this presence of God is there and the last one that probably one of the most important ones not a lifeless religious system and that follows with our thoughts this is not religion or a list of rules so i'll put an x on this meaning the living god meaning he's living he's i like for example when my kids came home there wasn't a list of rules on the refrigerator this is what dad wants done and you know you better do it because you're living in dad's house in the general sense, dad lived here too. And dad is in the other room, or dad's in the garage, or dad's coming home. Dad's part of this. So whatever the living dad, it wasn't just dad's house, you know, my boy's father's home. It was the living dad, meaning he's here. And he's going to ask you some questions. He's going to evaluate. He can, you know... You can have fellowship with him. You can ask him some questions. So this idea of we are the called out ones of the living God, it's not a dead philosophy or a dead idol. His presence is actually here, and it's not just rules. He is here with something more than a religious system, which leads into this next part right here, which is, oh, yeah. Oh, I, for, I missed all this almost. Okay. If I am delayed, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, God's home, which is the called out ones, the ecclesia of the living God. And what are you? You are, a. it says in the English standard, a pillar and buttress of the truth, or pillar and foundation of the truth. So that this is 
why the household of God has to be constructed correctly, behaving correctly. Uh, they have to be in fellowship with God because they are the pillar that's supporting something, you know, like a roof, you know, uh, a, a colonnade. And the pillar is standing and per- on a foundation. So the church is supporting the truth, and the pillar is resting on the foundation that's holding up the pillar that is supporting the truth. Now, this, be, this becomes a weird illustration if I do this, but we're going to go with it. Here's the truth, and the truth, I've always in the past, a lot of times want to say the, the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth, that that, that is the church is it, the, all the truth of God, the, the, the universal truths, everything. In context, this is, I think, the gospel, uh, and I'll say the revelation of the Word of God. It's, the, it's the, the things that we don't know from science, we don't know from philosophy. These are the things God has revealed in His written Word, the gospel. Like, for example, you're not going to come out, that's why the world struggles with the concept of Jesus, a man died on a cross and then paid for the sins of the whole world, uh, and then, then he came back to life. I mean, at what point does that even make sense? Everybody sins, so God sends his son, born of a, a, a virgin, uh, and then he, he nails him to a cross and kills him, and then you're all free to go. It's like, ah, oh, yes, that's what we see in nature. I mean, you don't see that anyway. I mean, it's, it's contrary to everything, so it needs to be revealed. So there's certain truths you can find in nature that God has revealed. Just Romans says that. But there's also things that have been revealed only through the truth. Now, here's the odd part about this. This truth that is necessary for the world is supported by these pillars. How's that for a pillar? Okay. These pillars, which are the church, is the pillar and the foundation of the truth. Now, if the truth is the gospel... This is the truth up here. This is the church here and here supporting this truth. Now, that you understand that what's wrong with that image is if we fail, the gospel fails, which, of course, you know, we could blow away with the wind and the gospel's still going to be there. It's still going to be true. And it, God will find some way of getting around it. Uh, Paul's image right here is at this time in history, the reason we exist as the household of God, the, the church of the living God, is we are the ones that are responsible for this truth. Uh, and it's going to go two things. It's going to go out to the nations, and it's also going to transform our lives and make us godly. So the church is the pillar and foundation of the church. You know what I would like to do is, is down here. Now, what, what's down here? You know, what's down here? Uh, this is what I would like to write, the word, you know, the word, you know, the rock. You know, we built our house upon the rock. You see how that it conflicts? I'm building my house on the rock, which is Jesus, or the word, or the gospel. So down in here. So that's another, a different illustration. I mean, we're standing on the word, building the church. Uh, Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church. Okay, I got that. Well, now Paul says, well, this church that God built on the rock on the uh, you know when he's at Caesarea Philippi and we talked about the house being built on the rock is now supporting the truth uh, and so somehow that gets kind of confusing except we could say the church is built on the word and the purpose for the church is the proclamation of this message which leads to this next point right here here we go uh, chapter 3 verse 16 and now he says this great indeed we confess, is the mystery of godliness. So, so all this is, he just got to say the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. And then he says, great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. And again, if I could say it, that's almost what I was referring to when the concept of Jesus being born of a virgin, God becoming a man, then going to the cross and paying for the sins of everybody from all time on a cross and then being resurrected and then going back, it's like, okay, whoa, wait, wait, how does that even make sense? And you got to, you know, if you think about it, there's, 
it would seem like for every sin should have, you know, for, or for every person should have their own, you know, it's like when the Jews sacrifice an animal for their sin, okay, you, you got this sin, we kill the animal, okay. Now we got to come back the next day, another guy's got an animal for his sin. That, you know, one for one, that kind of makes sense, except it's an animal for a man, that, that's not exactly equal. But just for Jesus to come, I mean, it, it makes sense in the revelation, but I have to admit, I mean, I think, there's nothing, Paul says it, great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. I mean, this mystery is, it's hard to wrap your mind around. So he says, here it is. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. That is the mystery of godliness. And that itself is mystery. <laughs> it's like the mystery of godliness. Now, godliness, before we go into this too far, uh, under, uh, underneath that on point, bottom of page three, uh, this is the Christ Creed. You could call this the Christ Hymn. Uh, I like to think of it as a creed that Paul's talking about some statements of faith. It's the center of the letter. It's, everything that's been written is based on supporting this, and everything coming after it is you know, because of it. And the focus is outreach to the world and Christian character. So it's both outreach and character. It's both we're changing the world with a message, but that message is changing us. We're becoming more and more godly. It's that living God. You're, you didn't just become a Christian, follow these ten rules, I'm here. It's like, no, you came in a sinner, and now you're in the household. And if, if say, we, uh, we had six boys, and let's say we, we brought someone, adopted someone into the family, uh, we brought them in, and they'd probably be, you know, we have a certain way, of, again, I'm going to paint my house like everybody's perfect, and, you know, we, everybody got along, and it's a beautiful world. So just go with that image. Uh, and we all got these rules, and I'm the dad, and everybody knows what dad expects, and he's easy to talk to. He never gets mad, but he always explains his reasons, and, all, you know, all this world that we're living in. Well, then we bring in somebody, someone else joins the family. They come from somewhere else, another culture, another family, another lifestyle, and they join. They're, they're glad to join. But they don't understand, they didn't grow up here. They, they, don't, they have a few rough spots. And so we're going to have to, you know, ease. Now, they're definitely a member of the family, but they're going to have to go through some training, and they're going to make some mistakes. We're going to be forgiving, and we're going to bring them up in the family, and, you know, as they are. It, it's growth. That is the way it is. People are joining the household of God, coming out of the world. And just because you come in, we can't just give you a list of rules. Here, do these ten rules, and you're part of the family. It's like, well, that's kind of lame because there's much more to being part of the household than just following these 10 rules. There's, there's relationships. There's understanding. There's freedom of thought. You're going to hear and understand the household policies, and then you're going to express them in your own way. In fact, I like to think about it that way, that out in the world, my household has been replicated six times. There's, there's six boys out there, five with wives, and five of, they all have children, right? Tony, she's not listening. Tony. All boys have children, right? Except Zach. Zach's not married. He doesn't have a wife or a child. <coughs> and we encourage the wife first before the child. But, uh, but anyway, they're, they're in a sense reflections of, it's similar. Of course, they've got their own, they're expressing themselves their own way. And funny, again, I don't want to be, be, beat this up, but some of them have changed some policies. It's like, this is the way it was in dad's house. And they, we've talked about it. They've intended us like that. I'm going to do it different. And I, 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 some of I go, yeah, I, I did the best I could coming out of the 80s, and I would do, and I was 23 or 25, I would do it different. But they say, I, you know, they make, some of them things, it's like almost very similar. Some of the things are, you know, they've made, what I'd say, improvements. So anyway, that's the ideal here of, of outreach, but also conformity. Um, down here, the point three, uh, this stresses the humanity of Christ, this whole word, these, this mystery here. Uh, godliness in the mystery of that God has become man, and now man can become godly. And that's the mystery of godliness. Is, is this Jesus, who is God, became man, and now man can become not God, but godly. 
you can become, you're, now you become the righteousness of Christ. You can become godly. And this is the mystery of godliness. How, how does that work? Where's the rules at? It's this right here. This man, God, became a man, Jesus. He became a man, and then he died for the sins of man. Yeah, are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure, because he was vindicated. Vindicated means he was proven right. Did that really happen? Yeah, because he came out of the grave. Meaning, he did. Are you sure he paid for the sins of man? Uh, Yeah, yeah, he came out of the grave. If he was still paying for the sins of man, or if he was just a man, he would still be in the grave. But he says, this is what I'm going to do, and he did it. How do we know? He was raised back to life. And then it goes on. Well, let's go ahead. I've got, I've got a little chart here. And again, we're going to rush through this right here. See if I can do this. There, there. First of all, that great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. Great is the word mega, which means great, large, wide. So great indeed, wide is this mystery. Great. It, it's bigger than your, I would say, it's bigger than your human mind can process. You can maybe follow philosophy. You can maybe start in algebra or work your way through math and get up doing some very advanced equations. It's possible. Now, again, it may take a while to get there, but it's humanly possible to understand these natural things. This mystery of godliness, uh, yeah, no. It's beyond. You're going to need the, the comfort. You're going to need the spirit to process this. Great is, again, is the mystery. And it says confess. We confess, or there's a word, homo, which means the same and logo referring to the word it means as agreed we together agree or by common consent admittedly without controversy great is the mystery of godliness and that is a statement that is we confess it means we there's no con everybody everybody homo everyone is saying the same thing it's the confession we all agree this mystery of godliness mystery which means you don't understand it. It's, it's ununderstandable. It's not something you can run a test, a scientific test. This is godliness is a mystery. Well, I'm going to follow these rules and I'm going to be godly. No, no, no. That's now a philosophy. That's now a, a cultural standard. The mystery of godliness, you cannot reduce godliness to a social standard. You cannot reduce godliness to our religious commitment. The godliness, it's a mystery. Well, how are we going to get it? Right. Everyone admits it. How are we going to become godly? It's a great mystery. Wide indeed, we confess, we all agree, it, it's beyond understanding. So, here it is. The mystery of godliness, it's all going to come out of Jesus. He was manifested in the flesh. He became a man. And there he was doing the things. And again, these are all uh, uh, headings. You know, like, it's like, it's not, well, he was born. In, what being born in Bethlehem has to do with it? It's more than being born in Bethlehem. He was born, grew up, lived, functioned, did everything, including going to the cross in the flesh. So from Bethlehem to the cross is that statement. He was manifested in the flesh. I mean, he was manifested in his ministry. He was manifested on the temple. Everything he did, he, he was in the flesh. But then what happened in the flesh? And it doesn't even say it here. It doesn't say nothing about it. he was crucified. That's assumed in flesh. Meaning when it says he was in the flesh, what happened in his flesh? Born in Bethlehem, grew up, did his ministry, crucified, buried, flesh. That, that's what the whole thing means. Vindicated by the Spirit. Vindicated means justified. It means vindicated, meaning he was proven. And what happens right here? This vindicated by the Spirit means resurrection. He came back to life, and now he's back alive. The man is back. He's like, you can't come back. You're dead. But I came back. How did you come back? The Spirit of God brought me back. God the Father. God, all three, sometimes God raised him from the dead. Jesus himself says, I lay my life down. I take it back up. Well, of course, he's God, and God raised him from the dead. Well, now the Spirit raised him. Well, I thought God the Father and God the Son raised him. Well, Spirit's God. So did God the Father raise him? Yes. Did God the Son raise him? Yes. Did God the Spirit raise him? Yes. Well, how can that be? Well, now you're getting it. It's, he's God. That's the God. And so the Spirit vindicated him. Now he's alive. This is interesting. Seen by angels, which goes into 
the spiritual realm, and it, that this becomes, uh, we're going to run out of time, we'll pick this up next week and clean it up. The angels would include, like, he went into Hades, or, or, or uh, uh, Tartarus, and proclaimed, preached the message to Tartarus. Somehow, the angelic realm saw, well, they saw God walking in a body. They saw God, who was dead as a man, come back to life, and now he's back in charge. He's talking to them. And somehow that's why he was seen by angels. Now that would be sometime like the resurrection. It's not necessarily right here. It was taken up to the glory. Then here's the point right here. Was proclaimed among the nations. Paul is doing that as, as it's taking place right here. Proclaiming this message of godliness. Jesus in the flesh died for our sins, resurrected, and the angels saw it. I mean, this is happening in a dimension that is beyond what you see. This is real time. They preach, and guess what? When they preach among the nations, that's ridiculous. That's, just, that's not even close to any of our gods. That's, uh, that, we don't even understand that. But God sent his spirit, sent his word, and guess what happened among the nations? Believed on in the world. That is a huge, you go to the nations in God, Satan's world. So God, Satan is the God of this age. Right, but watch this. He came in the flesh, was resurrected. The angels saw him, and now we're telling the nations. What does the nation say? We believe that. Well, welcome to godliness. And then once, they, once the world believed it, guess what? He's taken up to glory. And, and that, again, these are kind of out of what we'd say, what I'd like to see a sequential order, because I'd like to see, you know, I'd like to see crucified, dead, uh, buried, resurrected, uh, ascended, and then preached in the nations and believed, and then returns, you know, second coming. But the ideal is he came in the flesh, was resurrected by the Spirit, the angelic world saw him, the message that is being taught was preached to the nations, they believed, and he was taken up to glory, which indicates, in, in a, I'll quit here, is he is seated in the, in, in the glory today, but the intention is he is not done ruling and reigning. This, in a sense, is not completely done, because he's seated in glory, but he's waiting to come in glory and be seated here on earth as, at the second coming. So this, is, this taken up in glory is still kind of in process, just like he came in the flesh in Bethlehem. Well, we still got to grow up. He's still got to go through his ministry. Well, he's came in the flesh, just wait, and then die on the cross. So this flesh means this much. Vindicated by the Spirit, the seen by the angels, preach, and taken up to glory. He's ascended into heaven, but even the angels says this same Jesus is going to come back because his ascension to the glory is just a preparation for his be seated in glory. Because Jesus talked about when he returns and is seated on his throne in glory takes place here. So yes, he's seated in heavenly places. He's, he's, been, he's ascended. That whole ascension, in a sense, has not gone full circle, just like being born in Bethlehem. It's like, oh, he's coming to the flesh. Now, there's a lot to be done now that the baby's been born in Bethlehem. And he's taken up in glory. Well, yes, but there's a lot to take place yet. He's taken the glory. He's still got to finish the process. This right here, then, is the mystery of godliness. With this life inside of you, you become, you begin to grow and become godly. It's not rules. It's not religion. It's not regulations. It's Jesus Christ. Well, I know Jesus. Yes, but do you understand the power that he's released through this event. I'll pray. We'll pick this up next week and continue. Father, I do thank you for the chance to look into these things. We do rejoice with the fact that Jesus Christ has become one of us, that Jesus Christ has paid for our sins and been resurrected. We thank you for the power of the Spirit, the power of the Word that is uh, uh, working in our lives today. We ask that we would conform to it, that we'd allow and cooperate with the Spirit to do the things you've called us to, that we may become more and more godly, become more and more like Jesus Christ, that we may welcome him when he comes to in, in his kingdom. Father, we do thank you for this opportunity and ask that we may be good witnesses to the world with this message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your time.